Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students, welcome to Swayam Prabha channel. I am Swati Solanki working as assistant professor at Faculty of Law University of Delhi. I'm going to take up the course titled as white collar crimes and in today's session we are going to discuss the concept of white collar crime, definition, nature and its scope. Let's have a look at the objectives of today's session. First, to understand the definition of white collar crime propounded by Edwin H. Sutherland. Second, earlier theories of criminal behavior prior to Sutherland. Third, salient features of white collar crimes. Fourth, what is the distinction between white collar crimes and blue collar crimes, popularly known as traditional crimes. Fifth, white collar criminality in medical, business and other professions. Sixth, criteria for generalizing white collar criminality. Seventh, public welfare offenses as coined by Francis B. Sayer. Eighth, occupational behavior, occupational deviations and occupational crimes. Now, before we get into the definition of white collar crime as propounded by Edwin H. Sutherland in the year 1939, it is important for us to first understand that when we refer to the term white collar, it represents a social class which exists in the society. Now, one must think that when we are talking about white collar workers, we are referring to those people who are engaged in, let's say, clerical position or administrative position working in an office. So we are referring to that class who is dressed in white shirt, button down shirts. In contrast to this class, we have another categorization, which is known as blue collar class. Now, when we refer to the blue collar class, we are talking about those people who work in, let's say, a factory or any another industry. They would probably, you know, wear blue collar shirts or let's say boiler suits because blue is a color which would conceal the soil or dust that may be collected on their outfits. So it has some reference to the divide between the society, which is on the basis of the social class. Now, Edwin H. Sutherland's work is peculiar in this context because he was the first sociologist who pointed out that criminality does not only exist in the lower strata of the society, but we also need to look at the working class that exists in the same society. Now, before we get into the definition, please let's have a look at the slide. As I said, the definition of WCC was propounded by an American sociologist named as Edwin H. Sutherland in the year 1939. And I quote, a crime committed by a person of respectability and high social status during the course of his occupation. Now, we need to look at this definition carefully. The emphasis is on two aspects. One is on the status of the offender. Second, the correlation that exists between the offense and his occupation. Now, there are three ingredients in here which are important that a crime has been committed by a person. Second, this crime is committed by a person who belongs to the upper strata of the society, or we can say the working class of the society. Now, this person enjoys the high status and respectability in the society. So when I say this term, it means that these are the people who we look up to. These are the people who set the standards in the society. And the crime that is committed by this person has something to do with his occupation. Now, let's understand this with the help of an example. Imagine a politician has been uh, accused of committing the murder of his own wife. Now, definitely he has committed a crime. And when we think of a politician, he enjoys certain stature in the society. 
But when we look at the crime that he has committed, that is the murder of his own wife, whether this act, which is criminal offence, this act has something to do with the occupation that he was holding as a politician, the answer is certainly no. So what is the missing link here that there is no correlation between the act, which is the criminal offence and the occupation that he was holding. So there is no nexus between the occupation and the crime that he has committed. So this is one important distinction that we have to keep in mind. Now imagine the same politician has taken bribe to give a favorable order in the process of applying the tender to someone who is a friend to this politician. Now, when we talk about that he has given a favorable contract to a tenderer, this act has something to do with the occupation. So when we compare these two examples, in the first one, the murder of his wife, it had nothing to do with his occupation. But when we talk about taking of the bribe, giving a favorable order or contract to the tenderer, it has correlation with the occupation. So what is to be understood here, that the focus is on the fact that this person has committed an offence while holding his office, occupation or during the course of his trade and profession. Now why his work was peculiar? Please look at the slide. Sutherland's work was peculiar because he demonstrated that crime can be found to exist beyond the focus of popular preconception or we can say misconception. He was more concerned with who the alleged perpetrator was rather than what was done. Now, when we talk about this word popular preconception, what do we mean by it? Now, the earlier social scientists who had studied criminal behavior, they focused that the crime was located only in the social lower strata of the society and the reason for them to commit crime was poverty or sociopathic conditions associated with the poverty. So to simplify this, we can simply say, let's say a person who belongs to the lower strata of the society engages in snatching of chain or robbery. Why does this person commit a crime? The answer is simple because he does not have means to sustain himself. So he is committing this crime against the wealthy people who are belonging to the upper strata of the society. So all the people, social scientists and criminologists who studied criminal behavior, they believed it was a misconception. I am pointing out to this again. It was a misconception that crime has something to do with the poverty. And it was Sutherland who for the first time had shifted the focus from this lower strata of the society to the upper class or we can say the middle working class. He said that we need to look here as well because criminality can be found in this class as well. So he had written one article in the year 1939 which is called as white collar criminality. He believed that economists were acquainted with the business practices, but they did not look at business practices with from the lens of criminality. Likewise, sociologists were acquainted with criminal behavior, but they were not accustomed to the fact that this criminal behavior can also be found in the upper strata of the society. For these two reasons, his work is very important because he is the first person who has understood the intersectionality between the business practices and the criminal behavior. Now taking this discussion forward, please have a look on the next slide. So as I said that there were criminal uh, behavior theories which existed before the Sutherland's work, we need to understand that what were these criminal theories. People believed that uh, criminal behavior was concentrated in the lower class and this criminality is caused by poverty or by personal and social characteristics believed to be associated with poverty, including feeble-mindedness, psychopathic deviations, slum neighborhoods and deteriorated families. Again, the conventional conception was labeled as misleading by Sutherland as the explanation of criminal behavior were derived from the biased 
samples. And he shifted the attention from crime as a social phenomenon to a crime as an individual phenomenon. Now, the word that has been used here is biased sample. Now, what do we mean by that? As I said that sociologists or criminologists were only focused in the lower strata of the society. So when they were reading to understand the extent of criminal behavior, they were only focused on poor people as a social class. So when I'm drawing some conclusion wherein I am excluding middle class and upper class people, the answer is obvious that the conclusions will not truly represent the extent of criminal behavior that might exist in the society. So when a researcher conducts any research, we, talks about the, we talk about the sample size and sample would include that who are these people that we are considering into our research. So we were excluding the upper and the middle class and for that reason, Sutherland said that these samples were biased samples and automatically the results will also not be correct. Now, taking the discussion further, we then need to understand that who were these social scientists or criminologists who studied the criminal behavior. Now, one such criminologist is uh, Lombroso, who is popularly known as the father of modern criminology. Now, he was somebody who believed that why does a particular individual become a criminal or exhibit criminal behavior? So he was of the opinion that a person is a born criminal, meaning that the criminal tendencies are the innate tendencies of a person. So this is not because he is learning it from his social environment. He suggested that a person is a born criminal, simply stating that one may inherit the criminal behavior. Now, let's have a look. Cesare uh, Lombroso, 1876, he believed criminality is inherited and that someone is a born criminal could be identified by the way he looks. Now, he divided these criminals into different categories and the first one is born criminal. He said that certain physical characteristics can be taken as indicators of criminality. I have used an example here and I quote, a thief could be identified by his expressive face, manual dexterity and small and wandering eyes. So he focused on the physical attributes of a person, meaning how does a person looks can tell a lot about this person whether at some point he will exhibit the criminal behavior or not. Another example, somebody who had red short eyes could be perceived as a sexual predator. Someone who had a hawk shaped nose could be seen as a person who would commit the street crime. Now today if we think about these physical attributes, whether they indicate some criminality or criminal behavior, for us it doesn't add up. But at that point of time, his work was very much relevant. Now we get back to the first category that is born criminal. He then propounded the theory of atavism. So when we talk about atavism, we are referring to the atavistic characteristics. We are looking at the physical attributes. The second category is of insane criminals. Some people are showcasing some mental depravity or illness, right? Some people are mentally disabled alcoholics and they may exhibit paranoia. Now, these are the people because of their mental condition may engage in some kind of act which is criminal in its nature and Lombroso labeled them as insane criminals. Now, the third category is occasional criminals in bracket I have written epileptic. They are not the people who is exhibiting criminal behavior at all times but they are having episodes like one has the episode of epilepsy. These individuals were prone to sudden 
an uncontrollable burst of violence due to their epilepsy condition. Lombroso then believed that during these episodes, the individual could not be held responsible for their criminal acts as they were driven by their medical condition. Now, what was the criticism of the theory that was propounded by Lombroso was that you cannot associate physical characteristics with the criminal behavior because it doesn't add up. Why we say that? Because a person may not be a born criminal, he may be a normal individual, but because of social interaction, the environment that he lives in, he learned a certain kind of behavior which can be labeled as a criminal behavior. So for this reason, his uh, theory was criticized that he neglects to focus on the social interaction of the people. Taking the discussion further, we have another criminologist that is Edward A. Ross. In his book, Sin and Society, he pioneered this term called as criminaloids. Now, who are these criminaloids? A person who projects a respectable, upright facade in attempt to conceal a criminal personality. This category was utilized to characterize the class of offenders as white collar criminals. Now, when we look at this category of criminaloids, these are labeled as white collar criminaloids. Now, who are these people? Ross believed that these are individuals who plays the perfect mimicry of being a good man. He moves around in social circles where he is being respected and he sits with those people who enjoy a certain kind of respect and status in the society. So on the surface, they appear to be very normal people, but they use their appearance as a facade to conceal their criminal tendencies. Right? So when we talk about people who are working in the food sector and running the food sector business, they are the people who are deriving high revenues. They are the ones who enjoy the high status in the society. But little do we know that they are violating the regulations pertaining to the food safety. So why do they violate these regulations? Because obviously they want to uh, increase their profits and they are reckless to the means wherein they do not pay attention to the quality of food that we all consume. So what uh, Ross believed that they play the perfect mimicry of being a good man in the society. So when we talk about Edwin H. Sutherland's work, we cannot say that, that he conceptualized this phenomenon or new phenomenon into the void we can say now that it stemmed from this principle which is labeled as white collar criminaloids. So then he says, uh, Ross says, there is no physical stigma nor there is mental aberration that is attached to these people. Otherwise, they are malicious acts. They are quite normal persons. According to Ross, the most dangerous aspect of white collar criminaloid is their ability to manipulate social rules to their benefit, remaining largely unpenalized for their unlawful activities. Now, what do we mean by this? Ross believed that because these people enjoy a certain status in the society, they are the ones who set the social standards in the society. People look up to them. So these are the ones who escape the penal sanctions because they hold that much of power and he believed that this type of category of offenders is more dangerous than we compare it to the traditional offenders. Now, uh, now comes the point where in we are going to lay down the characteristics of white collar crimes. Now commonly it is perceived as that these are the non-violent crimes which are financially motivated. So the offender is not having any association with the victim in question. Rather, his sole objective is to maximize his profits. So there is no pre-existing relation between the offender and the 
victim in question. Why? Because the offender is solely focused on maximizing the profit. And these can be done by violating the regulations which are in place. Now, let's have a look. Now, there is no evil impulse in white collar criminaloids concept, but there is some sort of mor moral insensibility, right? There is an aberration. They are deviating from the norm. And why they are deviating? Because they are not taking any vengeance against the victim, but they solely want to maximize their profits. Second, that they want money, power, consideration, and simply stating in a word success like we all want but some people are careful about the means but these white collar criminaloids are reckless to what methods and procedures they are using so it is written but they are reckless the means so the end goal is profit and the procedure they use to meet this end goal they are reckless to those procedures now third they receive the credit from the community for the good they did, but not the same resentment for the wrongs they do relentlessly. Now, what do we mean by this? Now, how do these criminaloids work in the society? First, they create a goodwill for themselves in the society. They first create that social status among the masses wherein they are being respected by the members of any given society. Now, once they have attained that position of power, they start to misuse it, simply stating by violating regulations. And why do they do so? Because they want to make the personal gains. So let's imagine a scenario wherein a person has been known for helping the people who are coming from the lower state of the society. Ponzi scheme is one such scheme. Now, once they have created that repute for themselves, they are actually manipulating the masses. Now, when this comes to the surface that they have defrauded their own customers, we do not see the same type of resentment as we see in the traditional predatory offenses. So there is some sort of imbalance when we compare it to the resentment from the side of the society in the form of white collar criminality. Then criminaloids practice a protective mimicry of a good honest man as I discussed. Fifth point is very important that their victim is weak and their ally is the strong man. So when we think of Sutherland's concept of white collar crimes, he had drawn the attention as earlier discussed towards the business and the upper class. So we are not focusing on the fact that how these people are dressed because among these classes also, there can be people who are not wearing the white shirts. So he is not talking about how the person is dressing up, rather the focus is on the social status that one enjoys, the respectability that one enjoys. And then he goes on to explain that white collar criminality can be found in different terms and he then enlists different types of professions and we can read on the slide first. Misrepresentation in the financial statements of corporation, commercial briberies, now, let's understand this. To get a license, what I'm doing, I'm offering the illegal gratification to the person who's sitting in the authority. That is the understanding of commercial bribery. Bribery of public officials in order to secure favorable contracts. Misrepresentation in advertising and salesmanship. Embezzlement and misapplication of funds and tax frauds. So we are going to take this up in lecture number three where we discuss typology of white collar crimes meaning different types of white collar crimes. So what are the features of white collar crime? Non-violent crimes which are financially motivated. There is violation of the delegated or implied trust. It is the offender's position that offers them an opportunity to perpetrate such crimes. It flourishes at a point where powerful business and professional men 
come in contact with persons who are weak. Now, the loss to the society from white collar crime is much greater than the predatory offenses because the financial losses threatens the economic stability by eroding the trust of the people. So you may not understand these terms, we, but I am going to break down these terms for you. Now when we compare the white collar crimes to the traditional crimes, we need to understand that on what parameters white collar crimes can be distinguished from traditional offenses which are popularly known as the blue collar crime. Now, we have the parameters listed on this side and the first parameter is motive. Now, commonly it is perceived that traditional crimes are being perpetrated because there is some sort of greed or evil impulse or lust. So, when we talk about sexual offenses, which are predatory in nature, we see that these are the offenses wherein there is some element of lust that is involved. When we talk about evil impulse, let's say to settle the score against the victim, the perpetrator wanted to cause some harm to the victim. So there is some sort of evil impulse. Now what is greed? When we look at the traditional offences, if we were to draw a parallel in our existing Indian Penal Code, we may come across such cases wherein it is a simple example of theft, right? It is a simple example of chain snatching, which is known as a street crime, that a person who belongs to the lower strata of the society because he does not have the means to sustain himself, what he would do in the you know, absence of having enough job opportunities, these persons indulge in petty offences. So what is the motive for them to commit these crimes? Greed, right? Whereas if you look on the, on the right side, that is the white collar crimes, the evil impulse is missing because there is no pre-existing relationship between the victim and the offender. Rather, the motive in here is avarice and or we can say rapaciousness. So what do we mean by avarice or rapaciousness? It means extreme form of greed that these people want to accumulate wealth, right? Augmentation of wealth because they want to continue to enjoy that status for themselves. So for them, they do not care about what is happening to the victim. There is no violence that is involved in here. So there is excessive desire for wealth, usually in large amounts. Now taking the discussion forward, what is the background of these two crimes? When we look at traditional crimes, in here it may involve some emotional reaction let's say in the case of defamation or murder. But when we look at the white collar crimes, as I said, no emotional reaction between the offender and the victim. And the example in this point is hoarding of essential commodities. COVID times is the best example. Where is there is wherein there is scarcity of goods and people want to accumulate these essential goods so that they can then sell off these products at a fantastic profit. So when there is demand is increasing and supply is less because one has accumulated or hoarded these goods, the prices are going to increase naturally. So this is the example of white collar crime. Now taking the same example forward, let's talk about murder. In here, the nature of the injury is visible or apparent. We can say that someone has been murdered. It is seen by the naked eyes, meaning you and I can simply locate this harm or injury in the society, that this person has been murdered or this person has been caused some harm. So the nature of the injury is tangible in that sense. But when we talk about white collar crime, please have a look. The nature of injury is not visible. For an instance, a medical practitioner, in order to increase or make profits, he has suggested some unwarranted surgery where the person was perfectly healthy and normal. 
and why he suggested unwarranted surgery because he wanted to monetize the surgery right so later on this person realized that in the first place this surgery was never warranted so okay, you and i can see this injury the answer is no so in that context we say that in white collar crimes more often than not the nature of injury is not visible now let's talk about the victim in this case in traditional crimes there is a direct victim on whom the injury is inflicted or the loss is caused on the other hand in white collar crimes usually a section of the society particularly the consuming public is the victim example in this point is adulteration or in some cases even the direct victim is absent where one siphon of the money to the tax heaven country so there is no victim directly involved but rather the victim is the state because you are causing the loss to the exchequer of the state now having discussed these parameters we then need to understand that how these crimes are being perpetrated what is the modus operandi that the perpetrator uses in the traditional offenses and the white collar crimes now let's have a look in traditional offense such as robbery or assault you can find the element of force or violence being used on the other hand when we talk about white collar crimes one may say that the physical force is missing and the reliance is on the deception so when we talk about misleading advertisement there is no involvement of the use of force but rather people are been defrauded because the perpetrator has used the deception as the mode of perpetrating the crime taking uh, the discussion further this is the last uh, parameter when these crimes are perpetrated we then need to understand that what is the social response that how does society responds to a particular crime so when we talk about traditional offense we see that there is a resentment people condemn such act right and we say that people may believe that such a thing should not have taken place now when we talk about white collar crime let's say some businessman has uh, caused the bank fraud right he kept the fake collaterals to take bank loans to the tune of thousands of crores and he has now become a fugitive offender he has absconded to another country we may see some sort of resentment but this resentment is short lived we tend to forget very quickly right so what we see here that in traditional crimes the since the act is the physical one and the injury is apparent both individual and the social vengeance are likely to be aroused on the other hand when we talk about the white collar crime since the act is clandestine in its nature the same response is absent in white collar crime now what do we mean by the term clandestine now clandestine means something that has been done in secrecy so let's think of an instance where a public servant takes bribe would he be taking this bribe openly where he is seen by you and me the answer is no this bribe is taken away from the eyes of people meaning this act or this criminal offense is hashed in secrecy within the four walls so we say that the nature of white collar crime is clandestine it is secretive in its nature therefore the detection also then becomes very difficult so the same kind of response that we see in traditional offenses is missing in white collar crime now when we are talking about the social response another point is very important in here from the perspective of the victim 
Now, when we say that some harm has been caused to the victim, let's say grievous hurt, this victim would then be interested in prosecuting the perpetrator. Why? Because the nature of the injury is such. The victim knows that he has been harmed and this harm is a criminal offence. On the other hand, when we talk about white collar crime, as earlier discussed, unwarranted surgery has been suggested by the medical practitioner. This victim does not know that he has been harmed. So how he would then be interested in prosecuting this medical practitioner? So we then need to understand the response in terms of prosecution of the traditional offences perpetrator and the perpetrator existing in the white collar criminality. Now, coming back to the Sutherland's article, he made a very relevant point in his article of white collar criminality. Now, when we think of medical profession, it is considered to be one profession wherein we believe that the doctors would be the least corrupt. However, Sutherland went on to give one example. He said that two-third doctors practicing in New York have admitted that they have been guilty of fee splitting. Now, what do we mean by fee splitting? It is an act wherein the physician would recommend to the patient that you need to go to surgeon A and this surgeon A is somebody who is going to charge him the highest fee instead of recommending this patient to surgeon B who would offer him the best treatment. Now what is happening here? There is a collusion between the physician doctor and Dr. A who is a surgeon. So physician will take his commission from surgeon A who is going to charge the highest fee to this patient. And mind you, this fee splitting was a violation of the law existing in many of the states in the United States. So we need to understand that fee splitting is recognized as a criminal offense in the United States wherein the study, the study suggested that two-third doctors have admitted of this act of fee splitting which is the violation of the law. Now he then went on to give other examples as well that doctors have given false testimonies in accidental cases wherein they are taking commissions from the patients. They have also suggested unwarranted abortions, meaning the baby is perfectly healthy, but the patient has been suggested that it is life-threatening. Why did the doctor do so? Because he wanted to make profit out of it. So let's have a look at the slide. In medical profession, which was perceived to be less criminalistic than other professions, it was reported that more than two-thirds of the surgeons were involved in the fee splitting. Other violations involved illegal sale of narcotics or drugs, unnecessary treatments and surgeries, fraudulent reports, fraudulent testimonies in accident cases and generation of fake bills. Moving on further, Sutherland then described white collar crimes in business and other profession. In here, he suggested that the white collar criminality can be found in two terms. Let's understand these two terms. One, misrepresentation of asset value, which is commonly known as fraud or swindling. Now, what do we mean by that? That the organization or the company or the corporation is manipulating their own balance sheet, right? In order to create the reputation among the business world. So what we are saying, they are committing fraud. So they are misrepresenting the asset value which may be held by this organization or a corporation. Second is duplicity in the manipulation of power, which is known as the double cross. Now, let's understand this. 
with the example imagine a corporate director who acting on the inside information purchases land which the corporation will need and sells it at a fantastic profit to his corporation so what he is doing here he is using the inside information and he is using this information to make the personal gain now sutherland explains this example as that in this illustration the director is holding two antagonistic position now what is the meaning of antagonistic position two opposing positions two opposites position now one position which is the position of trust which is violated and that is generally by misapplication of funds and the second position is the personal position let's understand this with the help of an example imagine a situation where a football coach is permitted to be a referee in a football match where his own team is playing so this football coach is holding two positions here one is of the referee now when we think of a referee we believe that the referee is going to be neutral in this match and he will give the neutral decision there will not be any element of bias on the other hand he is holding the position of football coach of his own team so whenever he will violate the position of trust which is delegated in him as the referee of this match whenever he will violate that position of his trust he will do so to make the advantage to his personal position or we can say for his personal gain so he is holding to opposite position so sutherland very beautifully explains in here that whenever there will be a violation of the delegated trust the violation will be done to make an enrichment to his personal position simply stating for his personal gain and in the business world because of the complexities that exist these businessmen on a daily basis face this conundrum whether they should follow the ethics or they should give in wherein they are violating the position of the trust one embezzlement that has been done one embezzlement i'm saying by a white collar criminal that is equivalent to the six times of annual losses which may arise from 500 burglaries or robberies of the stores in that chain please have a look here staggering losses that can be attributed to white collar crime far outweigh those of street crimes or traditional crimes data suggested that an officer of chain grocery store in one year embezzled 600000 dollars which was six times as much as the annual losses from 500 burglaries and robberies of the stores in that chain so what do we look here that the financial cost in white collar crime outweighs right so the financial costs are much more grave and pervasive in the white collar crime now when we talk about whether only the financial loss that is important when we are looking at the white collar crime the answer is no what we also see that in addition to the financial losses it also creates distrust in the society so you and i will not believe uh within the regulators whose responsibility is to make sure that no violation occurs so what happens then that ultimately it is going to impact the economic growth of any given society so sutherland notes that white collar crime violates trust and therefore creates distrust which lowers social morale and produces a social disorganization on a large scale victims of the financial crimes do not lead them to avoiding the financial system in general nonetheless their trust in the financial regulators is eroded which hampers the economic growth 
Now, Sutherland believes that after having understood the white collar criminality existing in different uh, professions, medical, business, politics, commercial bribery, it is also important to understand that when one is trying to understand that what are the criteria that one should look into. So Sutherland then believes that sociologists or criminologists who earlier studied the criminal behavior by locating their data only limited to the lower social class, he then said biased sample leading to the wrong conclusions or generalizations. He says that convictions in the criminal court should be looked into when we are trying to understand the true extent of white collar criminality. This criterion of conviction should be supplemented with four other criteria. Now, the first is that other agencies in addition to criminal courts should also be taken into consideration. Now, what do we mean by this? Let's have a look at the slide. That criminal court is not the only agency which makes the official decision regarding the violation of criminal law. There are some other important agencies like administrative boards, bureaus and commissions and much of their work, if not all, consists of cases which are in the violation of criminal law. And each of these violations involve a charge of dishonesty which might have been tried in the criminal court as fraud. Now what Sutherland is trying to convey here? He is saying that some of these violations which necessarily includes a charge of dishonesty may have been tried as a fraud in the criminal courts but more often than not these violations are being heard in front of administrative boards, bureaus and commissions wherein the perpetrators are being let off with warnings, order to seize and desist or a loss of license. So essentially these violations are not always heard in the criminal court but can be heard in other substituted agencies. So if we say that 10 people have been found to be engaged in white collar criminals because we are extracting the data from the criminal courts only but 90 other people have been left out who might have been heard before this administrative or bureaus or commissions where the violations have taken place and they have been let off simply with the let's say imposition of fine or seizing of their license or cancellation of license. So if we are excluding those 90 other people we are not actually trying to understand the true extent of criminal behavior. So it is on this premise that Sutherland says that we must include these other important substituted agencies in addition to the criminal courts. Second is, he then says that convictability rather than actual conviction should be the criterion of criminality. Now, what do we mean by that? Many a times when criminologists studies a criminal behavior, they look into the antecedents of the perpetrator, that what was the history of this person? So Sutherland then says that it is appropriate for us to include the antecedents of white collar criminals wherein there might be some disciplinary inquiry against him, right? Maybe let's say for patent infringement, there might be some civil law violation which is not criminal, criminal in its nature. So he says that the history of this person wherein the disciplinary inquiry or warning or civil violations has taken place, this aspect of the offender should also be considered as one of the criterion. Now, why do we say that? Because when we look at these violations, the victim is not interested in seeing the perpetrator behind the bars, but rather, but rather they are interesting in securing right, the compensation or the losses that they have suffered. So what Sutherland then suggests that to understand the true extent, the antecedents, disciplinary inquiry, 
other sort of civil violations should also be included when we are looking into the true extent of criminal behavior. So what he says, evidence may appear in civil suit such as damages suit in the civil court because the injured party was more interested in securing the damages than in seeing the punishment inflicted. So therefore, convictability rather than the actual conviction should be the criterion. Now, moving forward to the third aspect, now, when we talk about white collar criminals, they have the ability to uh, pressurize the administration of law enforcement agencies into their favor. So when we talk about racketeers or the traditional offenders, they may have the ability to influence the pos uh, prospective witnesses. Likewise, because these people are coming from the social class, they may have the status to influence the criminal justice administration into their favor. So this aspect should also be taken into consideration. So there is another important person that is Daniel Drew. He says, law is like a cobweb. It is made for the flies and the smaller kind of insects, so to speak, but lets the big bumblebees break through. Now, what is the meaning of this? And when we talk about who are brought to the justice. These are the people who are, who are belonging to the lower social status of the society and people from the upper social strata are getting away. Why? Because they have the power and they have the status. Now, last aspect is that when we talk about, let's say, kidnapping, the FBI in the United States is interested in getting hold of all the accessories who helped in perpetration of the crime. So the prosecution is not only interested in who kidnapped the person, but they are also interested in prosecuting the other people who might have secreted away the victim, who might have called the person from whom the ransom is being asked, and lastly, who had put the money of the ransom into the circulation. So what is suggested here? that in traditional offenses, the prosecution does not stop only at one person. Whereas the experience with regard to the white collar criminals suggests that let's talk about where the politicians take bribe in collusion with the business enterprises. The businessmen are offering the bribe to the politician. But the experience suggests that the prosecution stops only at the politician and law is not interested in the other accessories to the crime who could be the business houses or the enterprises. Now look at the slide. Sutherland suggests the person who are accessory to a crime should also be included among the white collar criminals as they are among the other criminals. Political graft almost always involves collusion between politician and businessmen, but prosecution is generally limited to the politician. So if we were to sum up the um, theory of white collar criminality, Sutherland debunks this theory that crime is only located in the lower strata of the society. We must consider the other sample that is the middle or the upper working class. And this idea that the criminal of today was the problem child of yesterday does not hold true in the case of white collar crimes because these are the people who are not reared in poverty, but they are the people who belong to the affluent class, who have gone to the best of the institutions, who work for the business houses and banks, yet they choose to deviate from the uh, norm that is expected from them. And lastly, he says the theories that are used to explain the causation of the criminal theory same theory should also be used to explain both side of criminality, which is lower strata criminality and the upper strata criminality. Now, if we talk about the next aspect, it is important to understand that later on, these crimes were also be labeled as occupational crimes. In order to understand occupational crimes, it is important to understand these three terms, occupational behavior, occupational 
deviation and occupational crimes. Now, when we go to an office, we are expected to behave a certain way because there are some practices, some rules and norms that may exist in some workplace. Now, let's say one person deviated from those expected norms or ethics, we may say that person has made occupational deviation. For an instance, a worker may call to his employer that he is too sick to come to the work today. In reality, he may not be sick. So what we are looking here is occupational deviation. That This person has made deviation from the expected norm. But whether this deviation is violation of any law, the answer is certainly no. So he may be let off with a warning and other sort of occupational deviation may end in disciplinary inquiry, but not necessarily the deviation of criminal law. But what becomes uh, peculiar that when these occupational deviations violates any regulation as stipulated by the law or the act is a violation of the criminal law, one may say that this person working in the occupation has committed the occupational crime. The example in this point could be embezzlement. A financial manager diverting company's fund into personal accounts for personal use. So in occupational crime, you need to understand that the person is committing the crime. The employee is committing the crime against the employer. Now, later on, white collar crimes were recognized as regulatory offenses, wherein we see that these are labeled as strict liability offenses, wherein one may not focus on the mental culpability. Now, why it has been done? In order to protect the health and well-being of the society. So, in this context, Francis B. Sayer recognized these regulatory offenses as public welfare offenses, wherein the focus is on the act and it is not important whether the person had the intent to do this particular act or not. So, these are labeled as regulatory offenses to maintain the social order in the given society to protect the public health and wealth of the society. So he had divided the, these regulatory offenses into eight categories as you can see on the slide. Illegal sale of intoxicating liquor, sale of the adulterated food and drugs, sale of misbranded articles, violation of anti-narcotic drugs, criminal nuisance, violation of traffic regulation, violation of motor vehicle act regulation and lastly violation of general police regulation pass for the safety, health or well-being of the community. So in this context, certain critics say that white collar crimes are not actually the true crimes because they are just the regulatory offenses. So to, in today's session, we try to understand the concept of white collar criminality. We also then try to understand the occupational crimes and deviations with the another category of the crime that is the regulatory offenses as propounded by Francis B. Sire. Thank you.